Amen. Father God in heaven, we thank you once again for the opportunity to come before you. Father, receive revelation of your word, Father God, to learn your precepts, your principles, Father God, and just more than memorizing your word or just reading the words and just concentrating on the context, Father God, but give us the revelation, Father God, of the meaning behind these uh, scriptures, Father God, that we study, the meaning behind, Father God, the intent, Father God, what you have for us, Father God, that is included in these narratives that we have right now, Lord. May we get the revelation, Father God, and not just be guilty of just reading the word and listening and talking about the events, Father God, but may we know, Father God, what drives those events. So we may uh, apply, Father God, God, the things that are applicable to our life, Father God, be it to prevent us, Father God, from falling into disfavor with you, Father God, or Father God, may we see things that will encourage us with precepts that we've adapted, Father God. So I ask right now, Father God, you just reassure us, Father God, where we are correct, Father God, and warn us where we may be wrong, so that we, Father God, may be more complete in you. It's in the holy name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Well, all those that want to, please, you may unmute. I welcome you all once again. Uh, our intent tonight is to conclude Judges chapter 8. And if my memory is correct and my notes are correct, we will be covering from verse 22 to 35 in chapter 8. But before we go to chapter eight, I want to go back and uh, do a review that I think will set the presidents with eight. Because if you read eight, you've read what how the people responded after this victory. But to put things in context, because I know if you're like me, sometimes you get, we get to teach because this started back in six and we've done two chapters and, and it's all interconnected. Because what I'm going to attempt to do is go back to chapter six. So if you would, please, if you have your Bible, go back to chapter six. We're going to start with verse one. We're going to look at verse one through 10. Then we're going to segue to eight and see uh, how those two correlate. If that that's makes sense. Hopefully it'll, it'll make sense because God just happened to do that. Because we see they, they went through a situation but every situation we have with God, whether it's positive or negative, if we go back and pay attention, there was a beginning of it. And there was the process that you worked through. And then there was an end, a conclusion. See, that's how God works. There was a situation in chapter six. Then God gave a response and he uh, honored what the, the people request. I'm going to read that. through, We're going to talk about that. Then they went through the process because they asked for something, right? <laughs> and then they went through the process to get to where what they desired God to have uh, for themselves. But at the end of the pro process, when they, their desire of God has been fulfilled, then we're going to look at how they responded once they had obtained what they requested. <laughs> So, you know, hopefully everybody's tracking. Hopefully that's not too convoluted. So to try to set it up, if, if you read eight, this will make, I think, probably a little more, hopefully more sense. Hopefully you read that. But if not, we'll talk about that too. So let's, uh, if you would, please grab your Bible. Let's go to um, Judges chapter six. Verses one through 10. And... Uh, for the sake of conserving my voice and to hear another voice other than mine, I would request somebody to read Judges 6, 1 through 10 for us. It could be anybody. A nice, clear voice. Okay, Sister Lauren, I see your hand. I love volunteers. I'm reading from the Spirit, the New Spirit Filled Life Bible. Okay. I'm reading Judges chapter 6, 1 through 11. 10. 
Ken, I'm sorry. Yes, that's okay. The Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight. So the Lord handed them over to the Midianites for seven years. The Midianites of Midian, the Lord sent a prophet to the Israelite. He said, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel said. No, read through one, two, yeah. I'm sorry. Let me yeah, well, I'm one okay. through 10, not one and 10. Again. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Not my bad. One through 10. The Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight. So the Lord handed them over to the Midianites for seven years. The Midianites were so cruel that the Israelites made the hidden places for themselves in the mountains, caves, and strongholds. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, Maruder, from Midian, Amalek, and the people of East would attack Israel, camping in the land and destroying crops as far away as Gaza. They left the Israelites with nothing to eat, taking all the sheep, goats, cattle, and donkeys. These enemies hoard coming from their livestock and tents were as thick as locusts. They arrived on droves of camels to numerous to count and they stayed until the land was stripped bare. So Israel was reduced to starvation by the Midianites. Then the Israelites cried out to the Lord for help. When they cried out to the Lord because of Midian, the Lord sent a prophet to the Israelites. He said, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. I brought you up out of slavery in Egypt. I rescued you from the Egyptians and from all who oppressed you. I drove out your enemies and gave you their land. I told you, I am the Lord, your God. You must not worship the gods of the Amorites in, in whose land you now live, but you have not listened to me. Amen. And in the, spirit, in the, the New King James, at the end of verse 10 says, you have not obeyed my voice. <laughs> Same thing, just in a different way. You have not obeyed my voice. So in verse, in chapter uh, six, we want to, I want to extract about five points from these scriptures here before we go to uh, over to chapter uh, eight, because these are correlated. This was the beginning of the narrative, which now we see culminates in chapter eight. So sometimes it is, for me, I use this principle. I don't know if others do it. I'm assuming some probably do. You know, to understand where, how you got to where you were, you have to understand where you started from and what you asked for, and then you see it manifest. So we see in, in chapter, in verse one, it's a Sister Lauren, and thank you, Sister Lauren, for reading. You see in verse one that Israel did evil in the sight of God. Two things. We look at what they did. The children of Israel did evil in the sight of God. And what God's response to that was he, God, the most high, Yah, handed them over to the Midianites. Okay, we, we see that. That's the first point I want us to register. So they did evil and they were handed over by God. See, it doesn't say that the Midianites came and conquered them. It's that God handed them over to me because they, they did them evil. Now, Sister Lauren, if you were following the rest of the narrative from two to six, the Midianites were, they oppressed the, the Israelites, took all their food. And so they camped in, they were just so new, so they came in like locusts. So you can imagine that. You go to the commissary or the food line or wherever you shop, get all your groceries and stuff, and go out to load them up in your vehicle, and somebody just swamp through like Genghis Khan and just take all your food. You pay for it, you did all the work to get it, but it's taken from you. Now they may need lead you some spam or you know some buying sausage, but they're gonna take the the the, the benefit. They're gonna retake the vast majority of your food. So right now they've been handed over. Not only have they been handed over, but now by the people they're handed over to, they are being oppressed. <laughs> so let's follow the, the sequence. They did evil, God handed them over. And now the Midianites have the authority to oppress them because God gave them over to that. That's what four, uh, one through nine. I would uh, advise everybody to keep your notes.
to reemphasize one through six because it's good to look at this process in, in regular things. When I'm having, you know, disfavor, look like things not going right, I, I need to check this process out. Wait a minute, you, let me back up. Have I done evil in the light of, outside of the Lord? <laughs> if not, I need to get back on course. Because when things start to happen, one results can be that God's favor has gone. Not that the devil is, oh, I was launched into a sermon, but not that the devil has launched in and did anything in our life. I think believers give too much credit to Satan. Too much credit. Oh, the devil did this, the devil did that. Well, the devil a chump compared to God. God said, okay, no, you're not being afflicted because of the devil. You've been afflicted because of me. <laughs> because you have not been listening to me. So now you got to be spanked. <laughs> but you know, the good thing about it, now here comes the positive. And after we get to six, we look at verse seven, and it came to pass when the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. And that I think is right now where we see the pivot. Because they had been oppressed. <laughs> now let's go all the way back to the beginning, right? They were doing evil in the sight of God. Now God has allowed them to be oppressed, to be chastised, and now they are crying out to the very God that they've been doing evil in the sight of. But at least they knew enough to know what their source was. But they think, man, these Edomites, we can't do anything with these Midianites. We got the crowd to God here. And then if we look at 8 through 10, it says, then the Lord sent a prophet to the children of Israel, saying to them, Thus said the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up out of Egypt, I brought you out of the house of bondage, I have delivered you out of the hands of the Egyptians, out of the hands of all who opposed you. He let them know and driven them out before you. Also, I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not fear the gods of the Amorites. Do not worship them in whose land you dwell. But this is the catch. This is the hammer. <laughs> the hammer's in the nail to let make it clear to the children of Israel why they are in the circumstance they're in. But you have not obeyed my voice. So I'm like, God, you crying out to me, <laughs> but you're in your circumstance only because you disobeyed me. I want to let that marinate for a while. I'm in this circumstance because I disobeyed him. We'll use that generally. I don't know, we're everybody to reflect. That doesn't mean you're going to hell. That doesn't mean you've been condemned. God is reminding the children, he's reminding us that this is a process that just did not come upon you unintentionally. This is not some random circumstance just hopped on you out of nowhere. Just as the kingdom of darkness, the world order is order, so is the kingdom of God. There's consequences. In physics, there was a, it said every reaction has a, uh, now every action has a opposite and equal reaction. So if you punch something in a certain way, like a ball, that force is going to send that ball in the opposite direction when you hit it or when you kick it. So as a principle, but we have to understand the word of God. When we disobey God, there is a principle that goes into action in the kingdom. That's what God is telling us here. You want to be protected, do what I say. Because all these lessons are showing us like, okay, God is taking through all this and you, you've really been suffering. But God said, you, you need to know what got you there. You need to be reminded why you're in the state you're in. God is basically, I, I, I did nothing. To, but you don't see anything. He's, he's not being malicious toward him, not trying to wipe him out. He's just saying, reflect, understand. You are in this position because you did not listen to me. You didn't honor your God. You didn't stay in obedience to the most high God. Excuse me for that. So I want us to marinate to understand this is how everything we see, the war and everything, it started, the oppression started because they failed 
to listen to what God told them to do. That's going to be an important theme as we go on. Any questions or comment before we go over to the uh, to chapter eight? Because this is vital. Because we don't get this, a lot of things that I plan to talk about in chapter eight may not completely register. Yes, Pastor Day. As a comment, you was reading that. What kind of really stood out to me is, you know, like in verse one, it says that they did evil in the sight of the Lord. And this evil was not obeying His voice. And He says here that you know you're dwelling in these lands of the Amorites, but you know, you fear in their gods. And I was trying to apply that to me today. You know, sometime in the world we live in, you know, we have God's word. And I'm talking to me is sometimes it may be difficult sometime in the workplace and society to kind of go against the grain of the norm of what's in the society, you know, to agree with something that you may not, it may look right, sound right, but you know, that's not according to, you know, the voice of God or what mm -hmm. I would consider God's word. And we may find ourselves sometimes talking about myself, may end up being a compromising position. Not, not to me, sometimes it may not, and, and the people around me may not be considered bad, but in the sight of God, it's not, you know, it's contrary to his word. It's not exactly right. what he said. It might be close to what he said concerning any you know, thing dealing with society, but I'm telling myself, you got to be careful because if it doesn't line up with God's word. It may sound good, even coming from good people and society that we live in. I mean, you see everything today, even in the, what we consider a Christian world, it's not quite what we read in the word. And it's so easy to kind of go, go with the crowd, I would say, and not go against the grain because you don't want to, because, and I say this in, in the workplace, when you um, go against the grain around people sometimes sometimes you think you're going to lose your security right you know because around them you got a good word they like you you know and sometimes you don't want to make enemies per se yeah you, you know so i'm talking to myself got to be careful about that because i'd rather be an enemy to the man than an enemy to god right and and i think we we all to varying degree uh deal with that and i think the workplace is the most prevalent uh, mm -hmm. actions for that to where uh, you know and it, it's, it, it's involved in this but we are always going to be encountered in, in my view with the choice mm -hmm. of following the kingdom of God or following this world system mm -hmm. which is the kingdom of darkness it, it's always going to be it. And, and my prayer for KCM and actually in the believer for us to be able to discern because I'm telling you, Satan, Satan has so many, uh, he's got so much practice in that, you know, it, and he's got so many techniques. And hopefully I don't, I don't want to get too deep in the segue that unless we apply and are constantly always attempting to discern, we will miss it. <laughs> mm. And that doesn't mean anything. That's no reflection on anybody. I'm not saying anybody is less than, but I think if we're honest with ourselves, as more we get revelation of God, we can see things and things like that, things in church. It looks good. It sounds good. It smells good, but it's not God. <laughs> Say that again. It'll look good. It'll sound good. And it will smell good, but it's not God. <laughs> and it may not do any harm to anybody directly it may not be anything that's bad but it, it's i'll say one us to do is just miss god by a little bit because we miss him by a little bit we have missed him by a lot because god is non-negotiable like god god said hey you haven't listened to my voice you yeah. didn't obey what i told you to do you can't go but god i did this i went and did all that i, I did all these things here god, I, you didn't do what i told you to do see and that's the bottom line we got to get so in tune and and discipline ourselves to try to to recognize the voice of God. And if we don't know, but so I tell you right now, and it's easy for me because I'm a different thing, but I I got to go. I I be in neutral a lot. So I'm like, nah, I, I got to think. I you know I don't make rash decisions. Oh, this sounds good. It's actually people that I've known from where to go. Oh, I believe that one. But guy, one person been calling me over and over. Yeah. And I'm thinking, well, I have no reason to talk to this person. Not they haven't done anything bad. They have done nothing to hurt me. But I have no reason to talk to them. <laughs> so I don't. Yes, Pastor Day. 
Yeah, uh, when you were talking, and forgive me, I just want to throw something in you. And that's, I think, sometimes I'm talking about myself. Sometimes to me and my natural eye, you know, evil, and that's the thing, evil or darkness doesn't always seem dark. Right. You know, it doesn't present itself as darkness. And you got to really be on your, your game spiritually because, you know, like the scripture, when you're speaking, that scripture came to me as there's a way of, of, unto a man that seemeth right. Right. But the Bible said in the end, it'll end unto death. Right, that's what the so problem is. It may not, it may sound good to us, it may look good, it is popular. You know, what harm can that do? Or oh, it's just a little bit of compromise, but in the end, that way of us, if we're apart from the word of God, it will lead to death. Spiritual right. death and sometimes, unfortunately, sometimes physical death. Oh, oh, absolutely. Yeah, the ramifications would be unending. Any, anyone else, any more comments, questions, comments before we go to eight? Now, hopefully that's found out because I want to make sure when we transition that these two hopefully they're connect when we look at what's going on in, in chapter eight. So no more, no alibis. Okay. All right, great people. Let's go to chapter eight and conclude chapter eight. We are going to begin with verse 22. Let's read 22. I will read 22 and 23. Now, keep in mind what we just talked about, how the children of Israel got where they were and how they responded when they were desperate, when they wanted their situation to change, they called out to God. Okay, we want to keep that in mind. Verse 22 reads, now this is after the battle, after the kings have been conquered and killed. Verse 22 reads, then which means after the conclusion of all the battles, everything, the victory has been assured to the children of Israel. Then the men of Israel said to Gideon, rule over us, both you and your son and your grandsons also, for you have delivered us from the hand of Midian. But Gideon said to them, I will not rule over you, nor shall, shall my son rule over you, the Lord shall rule over you. Amen. Now understand the people, they cried out back at the end of uh, verse 10 in, in chapter six. They cried out to God and God told them what had happened, why they were in the condition they were. And now they've received that deliverance. They received that, that, that freedom. They received that yoke of the Midianites have been thrown off of them. So let's understand, when they were in trouble, who did they call on? They called on the Most High. Now that they got victory, who do they want to get a glory to? A man. To a man. <laughs> and not only a man, because this is talking about monarchy. They want him to rule. They want his children to rule. And they want his grandchildren, who may or may not even have been born yet, to rule over them. So I look at that principle, we get into something. <laughs> People get into something, I get into something. I go through it, God deliver me from it. And I go give the credit to a man. <laughs> now what they are actually asking for, when they ask Gideon and to rule over him and his son and his grandson, they wanted to give Gideon dominion over them. They wanted to give him power. They wanted him to have all the power. Well, the power of basically it was actually to be a king. <laughs> if you look at it, that, that's what they were there. They wanted Gideon to be a king, <laughs> their king. Mm -hmm. Now I kept thinking, I wonder why did they go to Gideon when, when they were in trouble, they called on God. <laughs> I see other gentlemen smiling. <laughs> I don't know if anybody else has entertained that question or see things the way I do. Mm -hmm. And this is not a, a riddle, but I, I think there's a principle that we might want to explore here. I want to explore. Eva, is that a hand? Yeah, I was thinking more of uh, they, they was very fleshly. And when they got in a tight bound, I think this put the spirit and the flesh was, was uh, that a battle. They were seeing a man, mm. that this sight, that that visual. And then, but they couldn't see the spirit 
of the Most High that really delivered them. They heard Joshua obey God. You know, they, they said, no, jo not Joshua, but Gideon was obeying God. Mm -hmm. Joshua was just a mere man. So they came to what they saw or who they saw instead of uh, crying out to the Most High. Again, Father, you lead us. You got us as you did before, even with the wars that we've been in. We, we, we see the victory. We can't see you per se in the natural, but we trust you. So that's the spiritual aspect of it, but they went to the man. Yeah, but John, but I, Gideon, I, I love Gideon. The way Gideon did it, he, he brought it right on back round to the most high. Right, and, and I would have to agree with that 100% from one perspective. Uh, I don't know if anybody has a thing to add or hmm. a, a, a view. Because they're right, they're taking their eyes off the uh, spiritual, but they put it on the, uh, like the physical. They wanted a king. But now that, that begs, and y'all forgive me to another question. These are questions I've been asking myself, so I'm, <laughs> I'm not asking them to try to, uh, appear to be more knowledgeable because I'm not pretending to know the answer. But, you know, they, they did go to the natural. When they cried out to the supernatural, was delivered by the supernatural power. So, yes, upper room, whoever that may be. Uh, I just want to say that yeah, you know, we still yet even do this today. You right. know, you oh, still see you pastors. <laughs> you see a lot of people would put, put, make the pastor God. And the pastor don't direct them to God. Right. Because, it, it, I mean, it, and it happens easily because pastors before them bring forth the word and bring forth what he hears from God. But a lot of times, you know, the pastor, and, and, and he may not start out that way, but some kind of way he ends up where he likes to add duration. Mm -hmm. and, he, and, 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 and he doesn't direct the people back to God, you know? And, but even with the, I see it even broader than that, even where, you know, voting for the president of the United States. Well, if we get a better president, we're going to have, I mean, our jobs and we're going to have better housing and we're going to have, you know, the price, you know what? And see, that is a problem. When we get to a place, and this is, I truly believe God is going to bring us to a place Mm -hmm. where we to our faces where we truly are going to realize it, it's not no man going to deliver us that's why it's not going to be no more martin luther kings and it's not going to be no more malcolm x's right. it ain't going to be nobody but jesus that's it that's the bottom line it, whatever we need god will do and yeah, he absolutely. really is looking he, he want us to look to him for everything but we even with the whole presidency, I see people like, well, you know, we're going to have groceries, bills are going to be cheaper, gas is going to be low. I don't care who in the White House. <laughs> God going to see to it because he know that these are things I have need of. I'm going to be able to pay for the gas. I'm going to be able to pay for my rent. My, I'm going to be able to pay for my groceries. Whatever right. I have need of, he will provide. And I don't look for a man to do these things. I look to God to do it, but, and that's what he wants in everything. Look to him, not man. Amen. Amen. That was an amplification of what Eva said. So you both on the same track, you have some different perspectives. And, and, and this is what, what I thought. I'm not throwing this out to, because both of you, I agree hundred percent with what both of you said. I'm going to make that clear. Well, as I'm concerned, you were right on, but think about this also. Let's add this to the pot. By the people, first they started out and got in the situation by disobeying God, okay? They cried out to God, God delivered them, <laughs> okay? <laughs> to don't be afraid of their gods, don't worship their gods. But once they get deliverance, as Eva said, now they want basically a king. Now, why do they want a king in my view? This is me. I'm not saying I'm right. I'm not saying anybody's right because I agree or oh, before I say I want to make this sure. Think about this. I have been delivered by God, but I know that I want the deliverance. But as even you 
been uh, so serious saying, I do not want to honor God. I want a proxy. I want a king to go fight for me. I want an army. I want people to protect me from the enemy because I know I'm not going to obey God again. I don't want to deal with God. I want somebody else to fight because I'm not going to change. I'm going to get right back into trouble. But instead of the turning God, I want to turn to this man and say, like you, you see what we're talking about in the past, I want to turn to this person here. I want this organization. I want this mm -hmm. office set up. But when I sin again, I don't have to go back to God. I got a, 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 a delegate to go fight on my behalf because I'm going to mess up again. We're going to be fighting somebody else because I know what happened when I disobey God. So I'm thinking in the, their mind, maybe spiritually, they, I'm, I'm going to come to you. They've already acknowledged that they're not going to do right. Wow. I need a king because I'm not going to do right. And God going to kick us to the curve again. And I want it already. We need to have to fight again. I want you to stay there, Gilly, because we're going to mess up again. We're going to need you to fight to meet somebody again. And that's sometimes what believers can do. And I'm coming to you, oh, go over and over and defer everything to the God. Oh, pray for me. And says, pray for me, Pastor. Do this. And the Pastor, oh, yeah, holy, oh, slinging all around. And then you got to do the same thing. You're going to get the same results. Okay, I better stop. Yes, people. <laughs> I just wanted to say, it, 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 and it's still going on to this day is that they wanted to be like the other nations. Right. Because they love their gods. Yeah. Yes. Remember now, the first battle, they brought that other god, whatever it was, back into the camp. Yeah, you think about it. When, when Gideon messed with their god, they were ready to kill Gideon. See, I was thinking about that too. These are the same folks, right? They wanted to be a king now, but I'm like, a couple of chapters, you know, a chapter so before, y'all were talking about killing him because he messed with Baal. Yeah. yeah. You messed with my money. You, okay, I, but, but you, you, you're, you're right. It's always focusing on the natural to try to achieve supernatural results, and that will never work. So that, that was concluded. That was one of my, in addition to the other thing, that was my other take on it. Because they're saying, they, we're going to do this process again. See, the only reason you're going to want an army, you're going to want somebody to fight. You're going to need a king. Because so far along now, you're going to start some trouble. I'm going to get very political now. That's the only reason the United States got a, a, a standing army of the nations. They're not trying to make peace. They're telling people, we got people going to fight because we're going to do something. We're going to need to fight. We're going to do something to you that you don't get so mad, we're going to have to fight you. The children of Israel, to me, were still saying, we are still going to rebel. So instead of going through this entire process, we're just going to from sin to war. Because mm -hmm. God already told me we're going to disobey him. We're going to disobey him again. And I don't know if they were consciously acknowledging that, but that's why you would want something. They wanted a substitute at Eva and, and, and to the about it. They wanted a substitute other than going to the most high. I want an alternative way to deal with my life situations. Mm -hmm. I want to live in the way I want, and I want to defer the consequences of somebody else. Yes. <laughs> I just wanted to say that somebody said something, you know, when they cried out, thank you, Father. When they cried out to the most high, even to this day and time, I think Sylvia brought a, a, a point. Even to this day and time, when we cry out to the most high, he yet hears us. But when we pray, we are praying concerning what he has spoken. In other words, we are praying to the most high God for a heavenly intervention. And that's what he do every time that we cry out to him. He always intervene as in accordance to his word, his will and his way and his promises to water his people. So when we cry here, cry out here, he always sends a heavenly intervention, you know? And so that that's what, I believe that's even going on to this day because we ain't to uh, worry about yeah, nothing. Yes, ab absolutely. Just like it's, you see, in this process, we're still now. People, I mean, this could go on and on because I, I agree 100%. It's just like it's a celebrant. We are substituting, well, not we, KCM, people that call themselves believers are substituting everything for God. Mm -hmm. Other things, other like politicians, pastors, Elders, Sunday school teachers, other people, you know, and Lord, I don't want to get into the whole net. But see, what God is saying, what did he tell him? You 
you are where you are because you did not obey my voice. So what's the solution to the problems? Obey his voice. Amen. See, all Amen. this, all this the church stuff, all this learning and reading and studying that we do is for one simple reason. We Come get on. an awareness where we can understand what is God and what is not. Amen. <laughs> it's not about racking up so many hours in Bible study or going to so many conferences or reading so many, you know, it's, I'm not saying anything necessarily wrong with those. But see, what the children of Israel wanted to do, it seemed like they were trying to substitute something else for obeying his voice. Yes, so sir. You know, I clearly think, though, people have a problem with what they cannot see. They do. Hallelujah. And that's why, you know, in the New Testament, the scripture says that blessed are those who believe and don't see. They're yes, even, because, you know, when you remember the story in Exodus, where the Most High told Moses to bring them around the mountain. They had to fast and pray, come around the mountain. And the Most High was going to come down and talk to them himself. Yes. yes. Right. And they were like, nope. When God came down, they were like, mm -mm. <laughs> no. Moses, let to... God talk to you and you talk to us. Okay. Now, it, and, and mm -hmm. they prefer. And that was fine, but you know, because that that they could literally they knew God was real, and still after several generations, they still strayed. Mm -hmm. But people, I really believe, have a problem with what they cannot see. And even though these things are not real, it's something that they can see and touch. Right. Okay. And we're about to see that right now. And and we do have the advantage in the latter days of having the Holy Spirit in yes. us as true believers. And now we can, uh, we have the ability to know the difference between what is God and what is us. We have yes. the ability. I'm not yes. saying it's always you. Oh, we have that ability. Yes, Elder Jones. Oh, Sister Jones, I don't know which. No, it was it was just me, Pastor Ed. Um, okay, yes. Um, I, I was just agreeing with Sister Sylvia wholeheartedly. And, and if you, I don't know if you guys remember when we, when I, um, taught on the book of Samuels and first Samuels when we talked about Saul and how the people wanted the king, you know, mm -hmm. although God had done everything yet, they yeah. still wanted one. Yeah. And it, it is, it's, it's a thing about the natural and the supernatural people are really, really, even today, yeah. you know, although many of us stand today and, and yet we say that we trust God, we believe in him and we know that he exists and we know all of this about him, but yet we do not trust the supernatural. Come on. You're right. We, we want to entertain everything naturally because we're such physical right. people, just like Sister Sylvia said. Because of the fact that we can't see it, we don't believe it. The faith. Uh, but yet we want to trust him when we have issues going on in our lives and we need him to intercede. Come interceding on. supernatural right we're going to believe and we're going to trust that he's going to intercede for us supernaturally but when it comes to trusting and believing in everything other than him helping you through uh you know whatever situation or issues that you're facing but to walk just naturally before god and allow him to lead you in the supernatural a lot of us, and, and I have to be guilty of it because I know a lot of times Sister Eva always says to me, okay, Joe, look at it supernaturally. And you know, mm -hmm. you have to get your mind right on the supernatural. No, for real, right. I'm, I, I'm mm -hmm. serious. Amen. It is, it's like that. It is something about looking at God in his, in his you know, that's his realm. Look yeah. at him in his yeah. realm. He yeah. is a spirit. And that's how we have to deal with him. Right. And yet many of us just don't know how to do that. Right. You know? And, and it, it takes some discipline. It takes some spiritual yes. discipline. Yes. And I'm not criticizing anybody. I'm not, uh, please, don't, 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 I'm not saying I'm like some master of this. It takes spiritual discipline because I, I remember I, I got to a point, I said something about soldiers this way back, because I've been retired a long time, but I 
told them once, not only can I hear what you say, I hear what you mean. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they stopped talking to me pretty much. <laughs> because, you know, I was speaking without realizing it then, I was speaking prophetically to the spirits because I was the first sergeant. And it was a terrible unit, but it was a, it, it was all kind of things because, it, you know, it, if you have some authority in a situation like that, in this unit, I want to wax on with a war tale. People want to uh, manipulate the power of the office, which means they want to manipulate me, to say things, to try to get me to agree with things, or try to flatter you, but yet by the same token, they try and next thing you know, they don't set a trap for you. So we have to discipline ourselves to be in a supernatural <laughs> mode, and they had not. But see, God told them, and see, sent a prophet. We didn't have to be like, but see, God didn't just arbitrarily, oh, y'all just all messed up. He sent a prophet that reminded them of what y'all did. Kind of like, like, like Pastor Dave was talking about, God, I did all this. Do you need more proof? <laughs> he said, no, you're where the situation you are. I'm still God, but you're where you are because you have failed to listen to my voice. And that is still applicable to us today. He didn't say you don't know my voice. He said you failed to listen to it. So God, you know, the way he structured that sentence, that made me, uh, that they should have been aware of hearing it. He sent a prophet. You can hear God. I mean, he sent a prophet to tell him. And it was generationally talk. What did they didn't know God? They constantly made the decision to disobey God, just like we do today. Same principle. Hadn't changed one hour. The same principle. But Gideon directed them back to God. Oh, man, this is great. Let's look at 24 through 27. And thank you, Sister Joseph, because that was all three of y'all comments. Yes, and all the comments are interwoven and all edifying each other. But let's read on. So Gideon told him that he wasn't going to rule over them. said, the Lord should rule over you. So Gideon said, no, I'm not going to be your king. You need to go and form your own relationship with God. See how similar that sounds today? Make him your king. Make him the highest authority. Give him dominion over your life. Give him mm -hmm. power in your life. Mm -hmm. That's what Gideon was telling them to do. You look at the word. So 24 reads, then Gideon said to them, I would make a request of you that each of you would give me an earring from his plunder. For they had golden earrings because they were Ishmaelites. And that was a custom. Y'all were golden, golden earrings. They killed them and took their gold. They didn't need it anymore. They were kind of like a June bug slave. They... <laughs> I had to get one in. <laughs> so they answered, we will gladly give them. And they spread out a garment and each man threw into the into it the earring from threw into it the earring from his plunder. Now the weight of the gold earrings requested was 1,000. 700 shekels of gold beside the crescent ornaments, pennants, and purple robes with the kings of Midian and beside the chains that were around the camel's neck. And that was about 43 pounds from what I read. Yeah. For Now verse 27. Then Gideon made it into an ephod, 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 and set it up in his city, Oprah. And all of Israel played the harlot with it there. It became a snare to Gideon and to his house. So Gideon didn't lead him, uh, didn't want to be the king. But he asked all the men for one uh, earring. So after the great event, they killed thousands of men. So it seemed like a little thing just throwing earrings. I'm sure they had other booty. But he took all of the gold melted it down and made an ephod. And I did the uh, uh, some studying on the ephod because it's actually two things. It's the garment that the high priest wore. Yes. But the ephod is also uh, a, a symbol. Somebody helped me out there. I thought of it as sort of like a medallion. It can, all, it can be the what you wear yeah. and it can be what you wear over it. Because I know in the children of Israel, that was the ephod that had the 12 stones in it. Right. But the ephod was also the... Uh, the garment it says called like a girdle or apron kind of thing. Yes. So he made an ephod and set it up in his hometown. <laughs> now the, the Bible said, I want to be splitting hair. I don't see any reference that God told Gideon to do that. I'm not criticizing Gideon, I'm just using that as a point. <laughs> because we see the results 
of setting up something as y'all alluded to, something physical. <laughs> he didn't take the gold for himself. He made an ephod of it, like a statue. I saw it as a statue of war trophy, kind of like they put up these fools that lost the Civil War. Yeah, I hope they look at this. The fools that lost the Civil War still putting up uh, these statues of these people that lost, losers. Who puts up a statue of losers? <laughs> okay, leave it alone, leave it alone. But he put up a statue, he put up the ephod as a sort of a war trophy, even though the ephod had holy implications, but he set it up in his hometown. But we can look at the consequences of that's one thing that Pastor Dave was talking about. One of those things that looks good, like ephod is a great thing, right? I saw his John shaking his hand. Yeah, the ephod was a holy, it was a vestige of the high priest. He set it up. But look what happened. The people played the harlot with it there. They start to worship the ephod. <laughs> you won't be the king, get in with, put up your, you know, like flavor plate. Okay, leave that alone. So now we see that Gideon is set up a physical representation, a statue, or a war trophy, or memorial of the conquest, which I see no indication that he was instructed to do out of gold, fine silver, because that's very attractive, 40 some pounds of gold. But the people start to worship it. Yes, Eva. I just wanted to say, I, I got out of this too, because I thought about from the past chapters that we have read and studied is that I, I thought of, I said, now, why would Gideon make this? Because he knew the history of his brethren, worshiping what? Idols. Idols. So why would he do this? You know, because they were so afraid. This, this is what I truly believe. They was a, they didn't want the supernatural to come in until they was in a desperate need that they couldn't get out of, or the most high put them in for them to cry out to him. Mm -hmm. So they didn't want to get into the supernatural, even in trusting the most high to, to lead them. So Gideon knew. <clears throat> if I put this, I don't know whether Gideon knew or not, but this, this <laughs> life was so, so historical in worshiping idols, even to this day, <laughs> to this day. So why would I want to push up, put something up that I know your history that's going to cause you to stumble? Hmm. Well, for what it's worth, you're in the same place I am. Yeah, I thought about that. that. God, you didn't tell me. I did some study. I Google some of the Bible of you know lessons that you see online and other theologians wrote. They didn't know. They said there's no evidence that they don't know why he get in there. I don't either. Yes, Pastor Dave. We might as well jump in. Oh, I'll, I I'll put my hand up because I'm, I'm clueless. I tried to put it back down because I'm about to get in trouble. Well, go ahead. Uh, I'm already man, there because I'm um, clueless why he did this. I was, you know, first of all, God, you know, you think about God, why he tell us man not to put up idols and monuments. And they sound good, but I was lately, I've been like studying each religion out. And um, it, it's amazing. Ever since we, and like mom and, and, and uh, sister Sylvia said, ever since we failed our relationship with God in Genesis, Man has always been steadily trying to replace God, replace the spiritual with the natural, because just like Satan said, we will be as God. We want to be able to have the answer. Mm -hmm. And I've been looking and I please, I don't want to, if anyone has anyone that does this or parents or friends or family members, but I just, I encourage you to do that. If you look at every religion, I'm looking at um, Buddha, Christian, um, uh, there's one, um, the, the, the Islam, Muslim, Hindu, uh, Catholicism, and even Christianity. I mean, you look at, we, man is, and I hate to say it, but man is good at crying out to God. We're not good at repenting. Mm -hmm. And that's, we could, because to repent, that means that we have to submit to God. Man still won't answer. And these monuments, and, and, and I didn't want to say it, but you look at e every religion, and you know, everyone has a symbol. And as Christian and Christian, we got to be careful about that. You know, even mm -hmm. we do. I mean, that steeple and, and, and that cross. 
and 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 the mother preaching lately about the cross and no offense but he's he's not on the cross right. but as christians we got that symbol of the cross you look at the episcopalian church and stuff they, they walk in with this cross and <laughs> even catholicism and i don't want to offend anyone please forgive me but i'm studying so study with me we can have a conversation <laughs> You know, and I didn't believe that until I'm studying now. And I had to talk to a, a person that a, a Catholic was talking about, you know, they praying to Mary. Absolutely. You know, and in the church, when you walk in, you got this emblem of Christ as, as the lamb and you got Mary, you pray to Mary. But every religion has that because we don't want to submit to God. It's easier to submit to man because, again, we're good at crying. We love to come to man like they come to meet him because you don't have to repent to come to a man. Right. All you got to do is just keep saying you're sorry. But God doesn't want us to cry out to him. And you see all through the word of God, we good at crying out. And, and that's a, that's that flesh that we don't want to humble ourselves and be obedient. But God doesn't. And, and even in Christianity, please forgive me. Don't want to offend nobody. You know, crying out to God, having 24-hour prayer and all that kind of stuff is wonderful. Nothing wrong. But after we do that, we have to repent. Right. And if the church is that we can do all that and we got to have 24 hour prayer five times a year, we got to shut ourselves in and all that's good. It's biblical to a degree. But you look at why men did that in the past. They always didn't come out just like we're reading now. They always didn't come out changed. And God, mm -hmm. man, and I repeat that, mm -hmm. forgive me. I'm not trying to offend about man. We're good at crying out to God, even mm -hmm. especially Christians. We're, we're pathetic at it. But when it comes to but we're not too good at repenting. God yeah. wants us to repent so we can don't have to cry out to God because we get, we spend so much time crying out to God we forget we're supposed to be about His business, <laughs> and that's why we don't want to we don't want to repent because repent you got to be saved from something to something. We don't want to save until the two. We rather go back and keep crying out to God all the time and keep our religiosity like we're doing something right. but we're not doing something for God because if we doing something for God we ain't got time to be crying out. We got time to be praying for direction, but mm. I'm gonna stop right there. Hope I ain't offend nobody, but you know. Yeah, I can't disagree with that. Just like Eve said, I don't know why he did it. And understand, you know, I got that at ephod that he set up, that was 43 pounds of gold. He got all yeah. this gold. And I'm not criticizing, but you put like 40 some pounds of gold up, and nobody how I couldn't tell it was safe. It's going to attract attention. And he put yeah. it up in his hometown. Man. It said it was a hometown. Yeah, mm -hmm. Gideon won this battle. There's the, the evidence. Mm -hmm. They like the Confederates are putting up statues of alleged heroes that lost. I don't understand. But, you know, to me, that principle still makes that little sense because that he fought, even Gideon didn't do anything. He was just obedient. And I'm coming to you, Sister Sylvia. Yeah. Yeah, that, again, I, I'm, I'm, I agree with you. I was confounded why I did it. It wasn't necessary. You should have stopped. In my view, just tell them you need for God to be your Lord. You need to, you know, let God rule over you. Yes, yeah, so Sylvia, I don't see you on the screen. Yeah, I, I um, oh, there you go. All right. Good. Yeah. I, uh, I, I don't believe he meant any harm by it. I don't either. I think his heart was right. <laughs> I, I really do. I believe his heart was right. And you know what? He, he, he just wanted, it was a memorial moment. Mm -hmm. And I think we do things like that. But it didn't become a stumbling block for him. It became a stumbling block to the people, people. because the right. people made it into an idol. Right. And, and, and the reason I say that is because I see as we read further, God didn't punish him or mm -mm. actually bless him, continue to bless him and not only his children. Mm -hmm. You know, his heart was right. You know, God look at our hearts. Right. Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and like I said, you and and I agree with Pastor what Pastor Dave was saying. We look at things, and I, I look. I say, let us all get delivered together. Yeah, the Catholic man. Church is the devil, <laughs> and everything and most things they've taught us is wicked. Okay, yeah. that cross, the the steeple, and all of it. I'm sorry. Like I said, I'm like with. I agree with Pastor Dave. Let us all learn together the truth. Okay, <laughs> let us all learn together. But and and these things I've seen people, you know, even we've all done, you know, the cross. We done went nail stuff to the cross, mm -hmm. prayed to the cross, you know, all those the different truth. things, prayed to the Jesus yeah. pictures mm -hmm. our mama had on the wall, you know, because we did it out of <laughs> ignorance. Changing. We didn't know any better. And Why you know, geez? but 
as we live, praise God, we learn. And when right. you know better, you do better. Absolutely. And, and I have to agree that, and hopefully it didn't see that we were bashing Gideon, uh, really what I was actually uh, looking at the results. Because yes. again, God didn't tell him, and then you're right, once we're going to read the rest here, it didn't look like, you know, God was upset that, you know, because he was honoring God. And that, that it's a nuance in there that we have to be aware of. <coughs> I think he was alluding to that, like, you know, these people are prone to idols. I'm not faulting Gideon because it's the people fault. Gideon didn't make them go worship. He didn't put this up and succumb mm -hmm. worship this. But at times of leaders, when we have influence, we have to be extremely careful of what we do and what we do not do and how we and do it and how we don't do it. Yeah. How we say, yeah. what we say and what we don't say. I found that out in, in the 12 years of being a pastor here. I'm like, well, I didn't mean to hurt, but you know, my mouth was just, yeah, my mouth ran ahead of my brain. <laughs> the older I get, the quieter I want to be, to be honest with you. <laughs> Amen. So it, it's really important. So it, it's, a, it's a good thing. You have to be sensitive. And I, I am convinced that Gideon put that up there to honor God and for the people to remind the people because he chose an ephod. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. See, he didn't just get some common thing. It wasn't like an idol of Baal. And that, that can, oh God, see, that leads to another thing. Something you do in, in church can look like something of, of, of God, but mm -hmm. The people will interpret it as something else. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I think that that can be the biggest challenge in taking responsibility for congregation is you, you better be prepared. Those of you want to be prepared to be misunderstood and misinterpreted. It's going to happen. Yes, even then we we'll move on. I just want it. I know you got it. Um, yeah. I just wanted to say, you said something about when I was doing a study concerning uh, uh, the worshiping of all these idols and putting up idols and statues and stuff like that. I can only testify concerning my husband and myself. And I think I testified to this probably last Wednesday. I was in a form of worshiping Baal and didn't even know it. Um, I, I had, well, of course, I repent and still repent for some things that's still in my life. I have not arrived. Um, and I found out the majority of the things that I was worshiping was sitting right in the church, in the, in the assemblies. <clears throat> so I had to look at it like, don't just think Baal is just one big thing. No, it's, 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 it's tentacles. It's so many things that I had worshiped down throughout my life from a child. Why? Because I was introduced to it through, uh, uh, um, um, whether, whether it's pagan, whether it's from a child, whether it was from uh, whatever, worshiping the, the, the Jesus that was hung between Martin Luther King and, and Robert F. Kennedy. I mean, all this stuff. I said, oh my God, Lord, have I been that misled? Yes, repent, not turn. Tear down those idols. That was thing. It started had to start right in my heart first. Then I had to admit that it was there. Then I had to repent from it and turn away from it. That's when my mindset began to change. Why? Because I began to get in his word and have no Amen. other God before him. Amen. You are correct. Let's look at uh, verses 28 and 29. So Gideon put up the uh, ephod in 28. 929 it says, Thus Midian was subdued before the children of Israel, so that they lifted their heads no more. And the country was quiet for 40 years in the days of Gideon. Then Jerubbabel, the son of Joash, went and dwelt in his own home. So he Gideon has set up the ephod. Midian has been subdued and said they lift their head up again. So now the roles are essentially reversed. So Midian has been conquered. There's peace for 40 years. Gideon goes home. And that was a series of alluded to the rest. Let's look at 30 and 32. It says, Gideon had 70 sons, not speaking of how blessed Gideon was for his obedience. He had 70 sons who were his own offspring, for he had many wives. And his concubine, who was Shechem, also bore him a son whose name was Abimelech. Abimelech. Now, Gideon, the son of Joash, right. 
at a good old age and was buried in the tomb of Joash, his father, in Oprah of the Abyssalites. Abyssalites. So we see that Gideon was blessed. He had a lot of children, <laughs> he had many wives, and he lived a long life. So he obeyed God, and we see the blessing that he received for that. That's pretty self explanatory. So, so Gideon was, was blessed in spite of what the people desire. So that shows that he, his consistent obedience to living to God's way led to him being a blessed man. I think we can all agree on that. Wow. Let's read on to the conclusion, 33 through 35. There we go. Here we go. <laughs> so it was as soon, as soon as Gideon was dead, the children of Israel again played the harlot with the bells and made Baal bereft their God. It says as soon. I know this is an interpretation. I don't know if they got it from the Hebrew. They make it seem like they went their way. Okay, get in there, boom. All right, back to normal. Let's go back to what we were doing before. So as soon as he died, it wasn't a transition. It wasn't any like, what are we going to do? Can we can drive on without Gideon? And it's interesting that as long as Gideon was alive, by reading this interpret this scripture, as long as Gideon was alive, the people didn't openly worship Baal. There you go. Woo! Now that, that is something. All their full faith, all their control strength was based in the fact that Gideon, the symbol of obedience to God, was there. So by when he died, now that showed something else, because so the series sort of leaded, alluded to it, something ear and evil, they weren't spiritual. They were only doing this because it was popular because of what Gideon had did. Yeah. It wasn't because, I think Pastor Dave talked about it, it wasn't because of anything they had done. Because I've seen people, you know, in the old days, they sit around and uh, I've been in situations uh, early on you be there and people might be playing cards and drinking, you know, a beer or something and smoking and then something like, oh yeah, that go past there. And they want to hide the building, almost knocked it over, putting the city. Like, hold up, hold up, wait a minute, no, no. You know, I'm not encouraging you to, to, to do things detrimental, but don't be changing because I'm here. I'm just mm -hmm. a man too, or any pastor. So we don't want to do that. We need to, when we, we talk about it, to get that relationship to where we don't need the visual man here to symbolize, I need to do right. Like I'm around Pastor Dave now, so I got to act all holy. But when Pastor Dave ain't around, I'm gonna cut up. So as soon as Gideon died, cause you know, it tells me they were waiting to cut up. <laughs> cause in their heart, they had not changed. I think he would mention that. There you go. There you go. In their heart, they had not changed. <laughs> And you, oh Lord, I better, I'm, I'm going to see it and then I'm, I'm on tape. How's this apply today? People every week, maybe two times a week, go into various assemblies and there's never anything that occurs. There's never any interaction that even motivates them to change their heart. Mm -hmm. They're never challenged to change their heart. They never presented tough choices. They never taught principles that should stir them to change right. their heart. All right. This is what this tells me. Because you shouldn't do right just because the pastor, the lot of pastors that don't do this, or the, or the elder Jones said don't do that. Well, what am I gonna do when I can't talk to Elder Jones? Mm -hmm. well, I'm just out of luck. There you go. Yeah. Keep sending till I see other Jones again. He had to set me straight. Mm. So that you that showed their heart hadn't changed. I'm not saying that to criticize them, but see, we don't want to get caught up in this cycle to try to act like we got we need something external for us to stay right with God. It's an internal, individual decision that we all make on a daily basis. So they as soon as Gideon died, they went back to the other God. Thus the children of Israel did not. Remember the Lord their God who had delivered them from the hands of their enemies on every side. You remember there before when we were talking, reading in chapter 6, verse 10, how God said, you you know, he sent the prophet and you're in this condition because you're not obeyed my voice. 
So they didn't even remember God anymore. And I, I know it's an interpretation. I didn't really look to see, you know, the significance of what don't even remember God. Don't even remember God. You know, one thing I used to be frustrated, like, you know, again, I'm gonna get in trouble, but I'll just be there. I, I I used to really not like sunrise services. Amen. <laughs> on, on what's called Easter Sunday. Because it would get all emotional and these people come up and make the altar call and uh, you never see them again. <laughs> that frustrated me to no end. <laughs> because I'm like, we just did them a disservice. Yeah. Matter of fact, I was thinking that person might be worse off now <laughs> because they did something emotional and was it part of the show? Was the, this whole thing all the theatrics? meant to play on people's emotions so we get a big crowd up to the altar like we done did something great for God today. Now we've done a great disservice to God today because we put on a dog and pony show that had zero effect. Now these people didn't even remember God anymore. And I see your hand to see when we get to here. Say they didn't even remember God anymore, nor did they show kindness to the house of the river bell, that's Gideon, in accordance to the good he done. They don't forgot God. They didn't even have any more respect. They didn't care about uh, Gideon either. <laughs> like he done served and delivered and he been kicked to the curb. Yes, so serious. You know, um, <laughs> I can, I, I can kind of understand that. I remember when I, when I gave my life to the Lord, when I actually first gave my life to the Lord, I was 21. I was on active duty and I was invited to a service by my, my, my section sergeant. And he, and um, I went to church with him a few times. And I, I remember going back to him one day um, on my lunch break, he was sitting in the arms room. And I was, I asked him, I said, you know, I asked him these questions. I was like, you know, I hear all of these things that you all talk about and, and the way you all say you feel, I said, but I don't understand it. And he asked me three questions. And I, I honestly can't remember, he asked me, did I, had I done three things? And one of them was, had I confessed my sins to the Lord and asked him to come into my life? And I was so excited. I ran to my room and both of my alcoholic roommates, neither one of them showed up. <laughs> and I was able to go to my room by myself and mm -hmm. pray. And, and I mm -hmm. did exactly that. I prayed and asked the Lord to come into my life. And man, I, I, it was, gosh, hallelujah, God. And it, but however, because there was no foundation, I mean, I given my life to the Lord and I would, and, and I was saved, but because not long after that, I, 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 I PCS, I was, um, moved to, um, left Frank, left Wordsburg and went to Frankfurt, but I didn't know what to do when times got hard. Mm -hmm. I didn't know how to pray. I didn't know, I wasn't a disciple. There was no time. It wasn't because they didn't want to, but there was no time. So eventually I backslid. So I really have a heart for a backslide. I really do. Cause mm -hmm. sometimes in those kind of situations, but I always remembered that moment because it was, gosh, it, it was an amazing memorial moment that me praying to God by myself in my room and, and repenting and asking him to come to my life. So a lot of it has to do with not being taught. And when you go back to what you were talking about with Gideon and how they backslid, it is going to show when there's no relationship with God. Right. It's about a personal, yeah, we come together together as a congregation and we hear the word go forth, but ultimately it's about each individual having their own personal relationship with the most high. Because nothing else matters outside of that. That's why that's rich. And I've often heard Pastor Dave say that scripture where he, he talks about what the Lord said. They say, I did this and this and this. And Lord said, I don't know you. Yeah, so 547. Yeah, I don't know you. I, we, we don't have no relationship. You know, you did, you do all, you can say all of these things and you've done these things, but ultimately there was never a relationship with God. And that's what I didn't have because I didn't know. As a babe, yeah, I got saved, but it stayed with me. Right. It stayed with me. 
Mm, yeah. And, and 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 you're right because the a congregation leads it, it's so much more. We our responsibility to each other never end, in my view. Yes. Mm -hmm. And one thing we have to recognize, and and this may sound sort of bizarre to maybe some church folks, but we got to reach that realization. Uh, I would refer to as you were speaking. We got to reach reach the realization we have an or understand a revelation that each believer is the tabernacle of the most high. Yes. Not the building that we go to, not a room, not anywhere we meet. We are individual tabernacles yes. for the most high because we are the indwelling Holy Spirit. And we have need to edify one another from this perspective. But what that, you know, and it actually, at this time, the people obviously didn't want that. Like you said, they didn't want that personal relationship. That's why I wanted you to be. They want to get in to be the king. Like, oh, we don't be responsible for ourselves. We want you to be responsible for us. We don't want you know, some come up, you just get an arm and go fight. We're going to keep drinking beer, doing whatever we do and playing with bail. But, you know, we don't want to suffer the consequences. We want somebody else to go out and take care of these consequences for us. Like people think you can come to a church service and they did all kind of evil, and now you want to come up and lay on the altar and want people to pray for you, and that like going to mystically and magically go away. God can deliver you, but if you don't stay delivered, like uh, whoever said, don't repent, you haven't changed, then guess what? It's like wash, rinse, repeat. You are going to go and experience the same things again. <laughs> it's like you're driving through a speed trap, and you'd be wondering why the police keep giving you a ticket. Well, you probably need to slow down. <laughs> oh, it must be devil. I just keep getting this ticket. Well, stop speeding. Do the speed trip. You know Roscoe and Ina is sitting there waiting for you. You know, I'm using that metaphorically. Because spiritually, we got to understand what we are. We are the tabernacle of the Most High. He dwells in us. We break that code and start acting like that, then we will see a revolution in the way we live. Yeah, we've gone over a bit. Okay, Eva. Uh, I'm sorry, baby. I just want to put um Sylvia so said something concerning relationship. And I know Pastor Day had done a teaching on that, and I probably I think still hitting on it a little bit in his teachings now. Um uh, if I can make, use Brother Carlos, uh the Spans and the Marshals for an example. And we know they they were in different states, but the Most High gave them and gave us an opportunity that they passed through Fayetteville, North Carolina, Fayetteville, North Carolina slash Fort Bragg. I truly believe spiritually, and yet we're now in the natural of it. If there would not have been a relationship with the Most High with them, and then coming into the relationship with us in the assembly of the ecclesia, they wouldn't probably be on this on this Zoom. They wouldn't have no kind of fellowship with us. Why? It's because relationships, somebody said, it keeps you together. And because the relationship that really matters is the relationship that we have with the Most High. So that relationship is, is so powerful. And uh, it, it, it unites us, not only in the natural, but also spiritual. So that relationship with him, I mean, it is so important because if there were no relationship, and what what would we do? I have a relationship, I'm quite sure some of us on here, I have a relationship with people that, my goodness, I don't know how, how, how far I go back, but it's relationship there because I know they know that I love the most high, they love the most high, and we love one another. Amen. And that's the relationship. Well, I'm going to pray and we will unmute. Uh, we will review this, uh, not the whole chapter, open up next. In case there's any questions, if you have any questions, please jot them down. We went through a lot tonight. Uh, so Amen. for the sake of time, we're going to pray and we'll have a, about five minutes with each other. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Father God, that mm -hmm. you keep making us aware, Father God, of your requirement, Father God, to please you how we can please you, Father God, how we can continue to please you, Father God, and how we can live a blessed life, Father God, and be used for your glory here on this earth, Father. Thank you for so graciously sharing yourself with us tonight. Thank you for the revelation. Thank you for your love, peace, 
and your joy. It's in Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. <clears throat>